Hey guys, and welcome back to our next set of notes. Today is going to be all about physical and chemical properties. So some of the characteristics of the different solids, liquids, and gases that surround us in our everyday life and what we can do to change them in different ways. So with that, let's get to it. Oh, there we go. There's the notes. All right. So today is going to be all about describing matter. So what are the different ways that we can describe some of the different solids, liquids, and gases that make up the world around us? And so we're going to be talking about physical properties and changes as well as chemical properties and changes. So first up, we have physical properties of matter, of substances. And a physical property is a property or a characteristic of a substance that you can observe without changing its identity, without changing it into something new. So if you remember from when we talked about the scientific method, observations are anything that you can determine using your five senses. So obviously sight is a big one that we use, but also smell, touch, taste, and hearing. All of these are different observations that you can make about an object. And if you're observing something about a particular substance, about a particular matter, then you are observing one of its physical properties. So something that you can see, touch, taste, smell, or hear about a substance without changing it into something new, without changing it into something different. So if we have a mixture of different substances, like we have a bunch of balls of different colors that are all mixed together, then we might be able to separate them out on the their physical property of color. Maybe if there's red, green, and blue balls all mixed together, you can separate them into a stack of red, a stack of green, and a stack of blue. And we might be able to separate them based on size. So which balls are bigger than the other ones? That's another physical property. And so we could put the big balls in one group and the small balls in another group. So physical properties you can use to separate out different mixtures of matter, different things that are mixed together. So the color, like I said, and size, the state that something is in is its physical property. So if you have an ice cube, it is a solid. If you have a cup of water, that's a liquid. Or if the water is in the air around you, that is a gas. And that is one of the physical properties of water, whether it's a liquid or a gas. Its other physical property is, like we talked about earlier, the temperature that it changes at. So water changes temperature or changes state at zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. It goes between solid and liquid at zero degrees, and it goes between liquid and gas at 100 degrees. This is a physical property as well. How dense that something is, so how heavy it is, um, based on its size, how much stuff is able to fit into a small area, its density, that's a physical property, and its mass, how heavy that something is. These are all things that you can observe about a matter. So you could also observe if something sounds really loud or really quiet, if it smells really bad, or if it tastes really sour, those would all be physical properties. So like we talked about water freezing, that's a physical property. Um, a plastic bottle, right? It's plastic, it's crinkly, it's small, you can see through it, it's clear. That's a physical property. So you can see with your eyes from one side of the bottle through it to another side. Um, metal is really hard, it's pretty dense and heavy. These are physical properties of metal. And then food, when it's rotting, it smells really bad, right? And if you take a bite out of a rotting peach or a rotting apple, you would know almost immediately because it would taste really gross too. So that smell and that taste would be a physical property of that rotting fruit. So anything that you can observe about a substance, whether it's color, shape, 
size, smell, taste, all of those are physical properties of that substance. So if we take a substance and change it up in some way, it might go through what's called a physical change. So a physical change is when we change the form of a substance without changing its identity. So we do not change it into something new. We just take it and make it look a little bit different than it did before. That is our physical change. So we're changing how it looks, but we're not turning it into something new. So all of the properties of that thing remain the same, right? If you took a big iron bar and cut it up into a whole bunch of little pieces, all those pieces would still be made out of iron. They would all still be magnetic, right? So you'd be able to attach magnets to them because their physical properties are the same. It would still be iron, it would still be heavy and dense and probably rough on the top. That, those are all physical properties and those all stay the same. It just maybe now is a little bit smaller than it was before. Physical changes are usually reversible, meaning that if we took that iron and cut it all up into pieces, we could, if we really wanted to, heat those pieces up and glue them back together. Or if you took a piece of paper and like put it through the paper shredder, then you'd have a bunch of little pieces of paper that you could, if you really wanted to, tape all back together and reconstruct that sheet of paper. Again, you can use these physical changes to separate mixtures. Maybe if you have two different liquids that boil at different temperatures, then you could start heating them up and eventually one would boil away, but the other one would still be there. That's like what happens if you're making cake or something that requires alcohol in it, like beer or wine. A lot of times when you bake it, that alcohol will all bake away and it'll just leave the malt or the grape flavor that was in the beverage to begin with. So melting stuff so like water, melting from ice into a liquid. Um, if you heat up rocks really, really hot, they turn into lava or magma, which is just molten rock. So a rock has gotten so hot that it has melted. That is a physical change as well. Dissolving stuff. So if you add sugar to like your coffee or sweet tea or something like that, and you stir it all around and it all dissolves, that sugar is still in there because that's what makes the sweet tea sweet and that's what makes your coffee taste good. But now instead of being in the big particles all stuck together that you can see, they're in tiny little invisible particles that you can't really detect anymore. But they're still there because you taste them on your tongue when you drink it. Grinding something, so like if you have to sharpen a knife or grind a piece of metal, you're basically just separating that into one sharp piece of metal and then lots of teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces of metal. Or shredding, like I talked about earlier, if you take a piece of paper and tear it all up into pieces, it's still paper. We haven't changed it into something new. It's not felt or fabric or something. It's still paper. It just is in a different form, a different form than what it was earlier. Instead of being in one nice big rectangular sheet, now it's in a whole bunch of little pieces, but it's still paper. It didn't change into anything new. So like putting wood through a wood chipper or using a saw in a workshop are physical changes. So we start off as one big piece of wood and are getting turned into lots of teeny tiny pieces of wood but the wood isn't changing into anything new. It's still wood, whether or not it's the big piece or the tiny pieces, it just happens to be in a different form now. It went from one giant piece to millions of tiny pieces. Same thing with if we boil water. So we heat up the water to the point where it's boiling. It's changing from a liquid to a gas, so there is a change going on, but it's going from liquid water to gas water or water vapor. We're not turning it into some different chemical. So therefore, it is a physical change. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, if you have sugar that you're adding to some water or some tea or something like that, you pour the sugar in, 
and you stir, stir the sugar around and it looks like it disappears. Well, what's happening is it's just going from a big sugar molecule, which is all this stuff all through here, into little teeny tiny sugar molecules. We're not turning the sugar into something new. There's no chemical reaction going on that's changing the sugar into something different. It's just going from big to small. And that is a physical change. It's still sugar, whether it's in big clumpy form or dissolved form in the water. It just is in a different form than what it was originally. That is a physical change. We end up with the same stuff we started with. It just looks a little bit different. This is completely different when we talk about a different kind of change, chemical changes. So in a chemical change, we are changing the identity of a substance. We're taking one substance, one chemical, and turning it into something completely new, completely different than what we had before. When you do this, your properties change, right? Because you're ending up with something new, something different than wasn't there before. So we're creating this new substance, this new matter. And the new matter might have properties that are different from the old matter. Chemical changes are usually pretty irreversible, meaning once that they happen, it's incredibly difficult. You have to do a whole nother set of reactions in order to reverse them. You can't just go back and forth easily. So there are some signs that you can look for to tell you that a chemical change might be happening. If your substance changes color, now I don't mean that like you're making Kool-Aid and you pour in the purple powder and then your water turns purple. That's not the kind of color change I'm talking about. I mean more like if you have a clear substance and you add in a different clear substance and all of a sudden purple appears. That would be a sign of a chemical change. If a new gas or solid is formed, so like all of a sudden something starts bubbling in your reaction, not because it's getting hot, just because of the chemicals that you've combined, that is a sign that a chemical change is going on. So like, you know, in the classic science fair experiment where the kid gets the volcano and mixes the baking powder and the vinegar, it bubbles up and creates this huge kind of bubbly mess because there's a chemical change that's going on when the vinegar and the baking soda interact with one another. Another really good sign that a chemical change is happening is you get light or heat out of your reaction. This is extremely co common in types of reactions called combustion reactions when you burn stuff. So burning is a form of chemical change. You're taking one substance, whether that's wood or gasoline or propane, combining it with heat and oxygen, which is causing it to combust and turn into usually carbon dioxide that's released up into the air as smoke. And then if you're burning wood, for example, then that changes into the ash that's left over, though just different it's a different set of chemicals than what was initially in the wood. So burning is a chemical change. So the, in order to run your car, you have to make all these little explosions of gasoline, and then out your exhaust comes water and CO2. That's because there's a chemical change going on inside of your car's engine that's converting your gasoline into light and heat and energy, and in the process is turning the pistons in your car to make it go, but also giving off some chemicals as a byproduct. Rusting is also a form of chemical change. So rusting is when you take iron, and it gets combined with oxygen, so like the oxygen that's in the air around us, and you end up with a different substance called iron, oxide. Iron oxide is that kind of reddish brownish flaky stuff that you see on rusted metal. So either on like a bike chain or on like a metal screw or nut that's been out in the elements for years and years. Instead of being a nice silvery 
gray color like it used to be, now it's all brown and orangey. That's because the iron has been chemically changed into iron oxide because it's reacted with the oxygen in the air over the period of many, many years. And iron oxide is a completely different substance than iron. So we had a change in the identity of the iron into the iron oxide. So like I mentioned, burning and rusting are two really good examples of chemical changes. We're having in burning, the carbon in the wood is reacting with the heat and the oxygen that's in the air and turning into carbon dioxide that's being given off as the smoke. So we're changing from carbon dioxide or carbon that's in the wood to carbon dioxide in the air. That's chemical change. Like I mentioned, all of this orangey stuff on these old pieces of metal is iron oxide, which is what happens when iron gets chemically changed by the oxygen that's in the air around it. And here we have a chemical change going on where like an Alka-Seltzer tablet, like an acid tablet, the old school ones that you put in the water, all these bubbles are being given off, not because it makes the water super hot and causes boiling to happen. That's not what's going on. Instead, we have these pills that are chemically reacting with the water that they're going into. And part of the chemical reaction is that they're giving off all this extra gas that's coming up and out of the water in the form of bubbles. So because we have a ton of gas being produced, we have a chemical reaction happening, which means that there's a chemical change going on in the system. In this case, we're chemically changing the Alka-Seltzer tablet into the medicine, which is gonna stay in the water, and the gas, which is gonna bubble up and leave. So something that describes whether or not a particular substance is gonna go through a chemical change is called its chemical property. So just like physical properties can describe some of the characteristics of a substance, chemical properties describe how likely a substance is going to go through a chemical change. So whether or not it's likely to burn up or to give off a lot of gas when it hits water or to rust and react with oxygen, all of these things are chemical properties of a substance. So how flammable that it is, right? Wood and gasoline and propane is all, and paper, stuff like that, very flammable, very easy to catch it on fire. But like metal or plastic, very difficult, right? So some things like wood and gas have a very high flammability, whereas things like plastics or metal have a very low flammability. So whether or not something is very likely to catch on fire, that is a chemical property. There's also reactivity, so how likely a substance is to undergo a chemical reaction with other substances. Certain chemicals like sodium and potassium are very, reactive. They are extremely likely to undergo very powerful chemical reactions with other certain chemicals that they could get mixed with. So whenever scientists have to deal with a pure form of these substances, they have to do it under very controlled conditions to make sure that they don't have this reaction happen. Other chemicals like neon, the stuff that goes into those pretty signs, and argon, another type of gas, are extremely non-reactive. 
they really, really do not like to react with other chemicals. They are much happier to just stay exactly as they are, no matter what kind of substances that you try to put them in. So how likely something is to react with other chemicals is a potential chemical property. So anything that describes how likely a substance is to undergo a chemical change is its chemical property or one of its chemical properties. Right. So, to review, the chemical or the physical properties of an object are things that you can observe about that object, like its weight, its size, its color, its density, stuff like that. And then a physical change is when you take that object and turn it into a different form, but keep it as the same substance. So whether or not your paper is in one full sheet or in a bunch of little shreds, whether or not your sugar is in big crystals or dissolved in water, it's still paper and it's still sugar, it's just in a different form. So if we have the same substance in a different form, excuse me, in a different form, it has gone through a physical change. A chemical change is when we take one substance and turn it into something different. So we burn gasoline in order to make energy for our car engines and to make CO2 and water that come out of our exhaust. We put the Alka-Seltzer tablet into the water and see all of the fizzing happening as it chemically reacts with the water in order to turn into medicine that helps our stomach. These are chemical changes. We start off with one substance and we turn it into something different. Again, physical is when we have the same substance just in a different form. We change how it looks, but we don't change what it is. Chemical is when we do change what's happening. We change it into something new. And so a chemical property of a substance just describes how likely is it to undergo a certain type of chemical change. Is it very likely to catch on fire or is it pretty flame retardant? Is it an extremely reactive dangerous chemical or is it a very stable non-reactive chemical? These are chemical properties that define different substances. So pretty short set of notes for this and the worksheet that goes along with it should be, I hope, pretty straightforward as well. So there's three parts to the worksheet. The first part is super simple. It gives you this little piece of wood right here, and it just wants you to describe three chemical, or excuse me, three physical properties about the wood. So again, anything that you could observe about a piece of wood, like a tree stump, those would be its physical properties. And then give one example of a chemical property for this wood. The next part asks you to identify each of these as a chemical or a physical property. So for each one of these, you're gonna write down a C, if you think it is a chemical property, if you think it describes how likely a substance is to go through a chemical reaction, or you're gonna write down a P if it is a physical property, if it's something that just physically describes what you can observe about that substance, whether it's iron, glass, ethanol, sulfur. You're just identifying whether or not the description is of a chemical or a physical property. For the last part, here, numbers one through 18 on the back page here. We have the same kind of structure set up. We're gonna be putting down chemical for C or physical with P. Only you're gonna be evaluating a change. So it's gonna describe a change that happens, whether it's a beaker of salt water that's boiled until the water leaves and the salt is there, or it's a plant that is doing photosynthesis and you're going to describe 
with a C or a P, whether each one of these changes is a physical change, you're changing a substance from one form into a different one while keeping the same substance, or you're gonna describe if it is a chemical change. Whether or not you start off with one substance or one set of matter, and you end up with something new, a different chemical, a different substance that you didn't have there before. All right, so P and C, P or C, and then just a couple little descriptions of this piece of wood. Hopefully that answers most of the questions that you guys have about physical and chemical changes and the homework that goes along with them. If you have any other questions, as always, you can always reach out to me through texting, through email, through leaving a comment on the Google Classroom. You can also come to one of our office hours during the week if you wanna ask me any questions in person, face to face. Once you're done with the worksheet, again, you can either edit it on your computer, print it off and write on it, or just write down the answers on a separate piece of paper, and then send your answers in to me either through text, email, or upload it onto the assignment on Google Classroom. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Let me know if you have any more questions. Now we'll see you all for our next lecture next time.